Hey, what's up, my dudes? Devayorn here, bringing you part two of our Divine Spellcasting Guide series. In this video, we're going to be talking about Divine Spell Level 2, available to Cleric, Druid, and Shaman, including the spells added through the SES Icewind Dale component as well. So just a couple quick caveats before we get started. We do play on Hardcore setting, where if the main character dies, it's game over, back to BG1, new character. We're playing on Insane Difficulty, so everyone in the party takes double damage. And finally, we have every component of SDS installed and maximized, so enemy spellcasters will have access to HLAs, they'll be precasting buffs and abilities, and all magical creatures will have a variety of nasty tools to play with in order to make the game much more challenging. So everything I say will be applied to that particular set of rules. However, 99% of what I say will apply to your core rules, unmodded runs as well. And I will do my best to highlight those differences for when a spell is really awesome, for no mods on core rules, and for when it's really good on SCS, but not so good for core rules. Now, we do have a tier system set up. S tier spells are the best. These spells are awesome. You should stock your spellbook with them. A tier spells are spells that are pretty good or situationally awesome. B tier spells are spells that are okay or situationally good. And C tier spells are spells that are really pretty crappy. And you only take them whenever you have to. And then finally, RP tier spells are spells that are absolutely terrible. And there's no reason to ever take them unless you're actively role playing. So we're going to start off with Druid and Shaman spells first. Very first spell here is Alicorn Lance. This is a spell available only to Druids and Shamans. Clerics don't get it. It was added through the ICS, or excuse me, the Icewind Dale component of SES. So this is a decent cast time of 5. We'll target one enemy creature. And it basically shoots out a lance that does 3d6 piercing damage with a saver spell for half. And regardless of whether it hits or not, it will always make the enemy... Um, Excuse me, uh, regardless of whether they save or not, it will always give the enemy a minus two penalty to their armor class for three rounds. This spell actually kind of annoys me, because it does piercing damage. Which means you can't use this to quickly kill undead like you can with a variety of other spells and abilities. Aside from the drain spells that you get from necromancy, pretty much every spell will one-shot a skeleton in Baldur's Gate 1. And this is one of the few that doesn't, because it does piercing damage, which they have physical resistance to. And for that reason, this spell... This spell could have been decent, but instead it's just going to be left at B tier for that reason. A lot of enemies in this game will have physical damage reduction, and this not doing magical but doing piercing really kind of screws it in a bad way. The minus two penalty to armor class is whatever, really doesn't add anything. It's not like, wow, now that I hit him with the Alicorn Lance, he's going to drop like a sack of potatoes. It doesn't really matter. It's not bad. I mean, it definitely is better than it doing nothing at all, but not enough to really merit taking this. The reason this is not C tier and is in fact B is because you'll find as we continue to talk about these spells that for the most part, Shaman and Druid get screwed pretty hard when it comes to level two. Even with the addition of Icewind Dale spells, their spells are still for the most part pretty terrible. And there's really nothing you can do about that. There's really nothing you can do about that. You'll notice that this is the only damage spell they get. Pretty much every other spell level in the game will have some sort of a spell that will do actual damage. And until this was added, uh, they didn't have anything. They actually unironically didn't have anything. So Alicorn Lance, I guess, is better than nothing in that regard, but it's it's not enough to actually make you want to stack your spell book with these. You might take one or two. It will do perfectly fine against the variety of humanoids that you encounter in this game, but typically you really don't need these for humanoids. I guess you could use it to interrupt a spellcaster, right? Like a cleric or wizard. But for the most part, you're going to be using cleric abilities like hold person or sleep or some other effect like that to take them down very, very quickly, in which case Alicorn Lance becomes a moot. But I would still take one, maybe two on a druid, especially if you have a lot of spell slots at this level, because there really isn't anything else that's really good to take aside from the spells we'll talk about a little bit later on here. But as far as damage goes, this is your only one. And so for that reason, it's B tier instead of C tier. So nothing really cool or amazing you can say to talk about this. There's no real cool tips or tricks that kind of, you'll kind of notice that for level two, there's really not much you can do with these spells aside from what they're intended to do. All right, up next is Barkskin. Barkskin, however, is available to Cleric, Druid, and Shaman. It's not just Druid and Shaman only like the Alicorn Lance. This spell is a touch spell, will affect one creature, decent cast time of five, and it lasts for one, excuse me, four rounds plus one round per level. And what it does is it will modify their base armor class to six plus one for every four levels of the caster. So at fifth level, uh, excuse me, at fourth level will be AC five, uh, four at AC, uh, excuse me, AC four at level eight, AC three at level 12, etc. And like most spells, this will cap out at 20. So above 20, that doesn't boost uh, their AC any higher. Let's see. Four, three, 
two, one. So at level 20, this will set their armor class to one, which is the equivalent of the level three mage spell spirit armor. However, unlike spirit armor, this spell only gives a plus one bonus to saves, um, and it doesn't include for magic. So in a sense, this is really a lot worse than spirit armor. Spirit armor can be cast on anybody. Granted, spirit armor is a level four spell, and this is level two, but there's no reason for you to be using a lower level uh, version of an armor spell in the first place, aside from the mage spell shield. Mage armor in general is just terrible because spirit armor is right next to it and bark skin is really no difference. The worst part about this is not only is the AC and the bonus really underwhelming, I guess you could argue that that isn't terrible considering it's a level 2 spell, but the fact that it only lasts 4 rounds plus 1 per level makes it absolutely horrendous. Shield, the level, mage, uh, the level 1 mage spell will last for an hour. That is plenty of time. You will rest before that spell goes off. Bark skin? This will wear off mid-combat. Shield's not going to wear off mid-combat, armor's not going to wear off mid-combat, spear and armor's not going to wear off mid-fight, but bark skin will. And it doesn't really give you enough of a boost to make up for the fact that this is such a short duration spell. You could argue that this could be cast on Kensai, Monks, Shapeshifter Druids, classes that can't wear armor in the first place, which would make this a little bit more useful, but as we already said, it's not enough. It's not enough. Even if you add in a variety of other buffs and enchantments, this isn't enough. Because these don't stack either, right? You can't cast Bark Skin on somebody who already has Spirit Armor or Mage Armor or something and expect it to be, you know, expect them to multiply and work together. What it's going to do, because it modifies base AC, is it's going to pick whichever one is best, and the other one does absolutely nothing aside from applying the saving throws. But again, one round per level is terrible. It's worthless. And even if you are casting this on your Kensei or your Monk or your Shapeshifter Druid, you're not going to walk into melee with that, because that's not going to be enough for you to actually melee. You don't have a helmet. Kensei, or Kensei has a lot more HP than a monk, but still not enough to where you can reliably go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, say, an ogre, for example. Because all it takes is one crit, and you turn into a big old pile of goo. And Barkskin just doesn't help you with that. It doesn't help you at all. I guess you could throw it on them and let them be rangers from the back, but if they're ranging, you don't have to worry about them getting hit anyways. You have other people in the front line who are taking and absorbing hits, so the AC really becomes completely irrelevant for the back line. Maybe for like a wizard or something, maybe for like Edwin, if you don't have armor and you don't have shield, you could use this to give some to give them some extra AC, but at the end of the day, all it takes is one crit anyways, and bark skin alone is not gonna be enough to help them survive. Enemies are still gonna reliably land hits, and on insane difficulty, your backline's gonna die even with bark skin up. It's just this does absolutely nothing really. If this lasted for a decent amount of time, you could potentially argue that it would be nice for the saving throw and the AC wouldn't be terrible. So I guess you could consider it really the druid, cleric, or uh, shaman version of the low-level mage armor spell. That's not amazing, but it's better than nothing. But in this case, it really isn't better than nothing. You don't have a lot of options, as I mentioned before, about spells for druids and shamans, but clerics you do. There's absolutely no reason to ever take this as a cleric, and even as a druid, it's really pushing it. You can wear armor as a druid. The only way you could get use out of this would be to cast it on other people, unless you're a shapeshifter, obviously, but then you're shapeshifting. And shapeshifting modifies your base AC anyway, so this doesn't help you then either. I just, I really can't find a good way to make use of this. I really can't. I just cannot think for the life of me of how I would actually get use out of this spell. Because if I'm using somebody who can't use armor, I'd rather use spirit armor. I'd rather use a different armor spell that will give them a lot more of a bonus that lasts for a lot longer with additional saving throw bonuses that are way better than this anyway. So it's just, it kills me. This spell sucks. Nothing you can really do about it. Skip it. C tier all the way. Up next is Beast Claw. This is also available only to druids and shamans. Another spell added by Icewind Dale. This is a little more interesting, but still not all that great. It lasts for one turn as a cast time of five, so not too terribly long. And what it does is it modifies your main hand weapon, just like all the other conjuration weapon spells. And it will set your strength to 1872, and it will deal 2d4 damage. Plus strength bonus that's irrelevant. Every weapon in the game gives you strength bonus, so I don't know why it says that here. Uh, points of slashing damage, and you can attack twice per round with the claws with a plus two bonus to hit. So on paper, this doesn't look half bad, right? Two attacks per round, two bonus to hit, 2d4 slashing damage, 1872 strength, right? The problem is, as a druid, you still don't want to use this. You still don't want to be walking into melee as a druid or a shaman, because you really don't have the HP to tank anything. You really don't have any natural bonuses or abilities to go into melee and reliably do damage without getting your ass pounded. D8 HP is not enough to survive in melee on insane difficulty. It's just flat out not. Even fighters like Kaken will get chunked and have to run out of melee. As a clear, excuse me, as a druid or shaman, it's not even close. Not even close. The fact that it, you could argue that this would be useful for a fighter druid, right? A fighter druid. 
Obviously, cleric doesn't matter because cleric doesn't get this. So fighter, a fighter cleric would be interesting, but it doesn't matter. For a fighter druid, you would say, oh, you know, this would be perfect for that. The thing is, if you're a fighter druid, chances are you have better than 1872 strength anyways, right? And eventually you're going to get the tome from BG1 and go to 19 strength, in which case this is actually making you do a lot less damage. In addition, you already have proficiency points spent, so the extra attack per round doesn't really help that much either because you are already getting a bonus attack per round because you have specialization, right? At no point when someone makes a fighter druid at this stage, assuming you're watching my video, you're not brand new to the game, so you know not to put one point in a variety of weapons. You know to put as many points as you can into one proficiency. So in order to get the access to the plus one thaco, plus two damage, and half attack per round. So this really doesn't help that much either. And then you have a plus two bonus to hit, which isn't bad when you're using non-magical weapons. But if you're already a level three druid, chances are you've already found a magical weapon. I mean, if you really, really want to, you could pop an invis pod, head over to Durlags and get a plus two scimitar, and I'll take you 30 seconds, you know? There's so many ways to get magical weapons where the plus two bonus doesn't really help either. And then, of course, you're not getting bonus damage from your weapons either when you have this equipped. The one thing that's interesting about this spell that would almost make it useful is the fact that you can dual wield with it, right? You can cast this spell and then throw a weapon in your offhand and still get that extra attack per round, which is nice. Because the cool thing about Beast Claw is it doesn't take into consideration dual wield penalty. Whenever you use any conjuration spell in the game, that includes Flame Blade, Spiritual Hammer, Black Blade of Disaster, etc. You basically, the game treats you as not dual wielding, even though you are. In the sense that dual wielding penalty just disappears. Proficiency disappears. All proficiencies disappear whenever you're uh, casting one of these spells. That's just the way it works. That way you can't benefit from, let's say if you have five points in Warhammer, you can't summon Spiritual Hammer and then automatically have Grand Mastery and a summon weapon. The game doesn't work like that. So it just completely removes all proficiencies. But this means that if you're a Druid, a pure Druid, or for some weird reason you're a Fighter Druid who did not put any points into dual wielding, this would allow you to dual wield without a penalty by casting this spell. But as I mentioned before, it only lasts for one turn, which really isn't that long. One turn is definitely a lot better than bark skin over here. But at the same time, it's really not long enough to... It's long enough to kill, kill some maybe a troop of Exvarts or Kobolds or something. But by the time you get to the next pack in Nashgill Mine, the spell is gone. And you have eight or nine packs before you actually get to Mulhay himself. And so unless you're taking like six or seven of these, which is just ridiculous, it's going to wear off long before then, while a Mage Armor spell, for example, is going to last plenty of time. Or a Sleep spell is going to annihilate an entire group without anybody getting hit at all. Well, Beast Claw, you still have to land the attacks. And then you could say, well, you know, I have a Mage over here casting Sleep, and then I can run in with Beast Claw and my Druid getting the extra attacks per round, and I could rip them to pieces. Yeah, you could, but you can also kill a group of unconscious enemies just fine with a club anyway. It's not like you needed Beast Claw to do that. And again, if you're a fighter druid, chances are you already have two points of dual wield anyways. I guess the only way you could make use of this is if you're not putting any points into dual wielding because you know you're going to be using Earth Elemental Transformation, then maybe you could justify doing this and dual wielding and taking advantage of the fact that you don't get any penalty whatsoever while using Beast Claw. But that still, to me, is not enough to make this anything but a C-tier spell. It's just not good enough. The 1872 isn't bad, especially if you're a pure druid, right? That's obviously a nice boost, but again, if you're running into melee as a druid, you're you're doing it wrong anyways. You're doing it wrong anyways. You can, but that's not what I would recommend for a druid. That's not what I would recommend. Up next is Charm Person or Mammal. Uh, this spell is... I think I have this at B tier. Let me double check. No, I still have it at C tier. And it's understandably so. This spell is pretty much the exact same as Charm Person from the Wizard spell. Has a decent cast time of 5, targets one person or mammal, uh, saving throw negates, and it lasts for one turn. Just like Charm Person spell that we talked about, Wizard level 1, you get to have all the fun dialogue conversations with them. They also have the plus 3 saving throw modifier. Oh, this is Druid and Shaman only, I forgot to mention that. They still get the plus 3 saving throw modifier. So, if you're charming anything that's a remotely decent level, chances are this is not going to go off. But if for low levels, this will actually be fairly useful. The problem is, on paper, it looks like it's fairly useful, but when you actually think about it, it starts to fall apart. Let me explain. If you're fighting a group of kobolds, throwing a charm on one is a complete waste of time. Charming one kobold is not going to turn you the fight. It's not. The enemies you really would like to charm that come in groups would be like spiders, ettercaps, uh, wyverns. That would be really nice. Um, and you can't charm any of these creatures. Those are the creatures you can't charm. Basilisks, also uncharmable. 
because basilisks are reptiles. Ettercaps, spiders are considered arachnids. Uh, I don't even know what wyverns are classified as, but you can't charm them because they're not mammals. So the only thing you can, the only real mammal I can think of you charming in this game would be like a bear. And bears don't come in massive packs. The scariest bears are like polar bears because they have ridiculous strength. And polar bears always come by themselves. You just have one person run around in a circle while you range it down. I guess you could get attacked by a pack of, uh, a pack of black bears, but they die pretty quickly, easily anyway. So it's not like you really need charm person to turn the tide there. I mean, I'm pretty sure they're even sleepable. Even with SES, um, most bears in this game are sleepable. So I just can't think of a time you'd really want to use this spell. Now, maybe if you're getting ambushed by like, uh, you know, the Amazons or the dwarves or something then this would be more useful, but those guys actually have pretty decent saves. Not amazing, but decent. Decent enough to where with a plus three modifier, this spell isn't gonna work more often than, is this fail, this spell is gonna fail more often than not. Especially when you compare it to like Hold Person that the cleric gets. This spell just seems to fail so badly. And it's a shame because Charm Person is a really fun spell to play with, but it's just, it's really weak. It's really, really weak. And the mammal uh, secondary effect because Charm Person only works on people, right? That's what the Wizard One does. This is Charm Person or Mammal, but I can't, I literally can't think of any mammals I'd be using this on aside from bears. And again, that's only in that one pack of bears, and even then, you can take them out so easily anyway, so I just, I don't see what the point of this spell is. Aside from you just having the same fun that wizards have by charming people and getting their unique dialogues and talking to them. Using this in the middle of the fight is just, I mean, you can. But again, it's just, it's whatever, you know, it's like whatever. It's Alicorn, Lance, Beast Claw. You'll find that Druid and Shaman really get screwed at level 2. It's really, really bad. Really, really painful. Charm Person is not an amazing spell. It's fun to play with, like I said, with the, the Wizard one. is just super fun to play with, but this has the same immunities, right? It doesn't work on Ogres. That's another thing that'd be super fucking handy, is if you're fighting some Ogre Berserkers, or some other Ogres that don't have Berserking up, and you hit them with a Charm, that'd be so nice, but you can't do that. You can't. And try to charm higher level enemies, higher level humanoids, I should say. It's just, it's going to fail more often than not because of the plus three modifier. So, C tier for sure. Up next is probably their best spell aside from Slow Poison, Cure Moderate Wounds. This is a spell that has been added by Icewind Dale SES. This will be for clerics, druids, and shamans, so all three divine spellcasters get it. And this is basically just the spell in between Cure Light Wounds and Cure Medium Wounds. As a touch, just like before, decent cast time of five, so you can use it in combat. And it heals 2d8 plus uh, one per level. That's it. And also cures intoxication. They're completely irrelevant. No effect on undead, constructs, or exoplanar creatures. Obviously, it doesn't matter. This is just a pretty decent heal. It's not, you know, cure serious wounds or cure critical, but it can actually get pretty damn close. It's actually pretty damn close, especially when you get higher level. I typically will take a couple of these, especially on a druid, because there's really nothing else to take. As I mentioned before, they get shafted pretty hard here. Um, and it's pretty decent. There's really nothing cool or interesting you can do with cure moderate wounds. It's just a healing spell. But you know what? That's a lot better than the other crap they get, so... B tier all the way. Up next, Find Traps, one of the most useless spells you can get. This lasts for three turns, decent cast time of five, and it literally allows you to find traps. I guess you could argue that this does actually have a 100% chance to find traps, right? Unlike uh, using a thief, if you don't have Find Traps max, you might miss a trap. But chances are, this is not your first time playing this game. You know where the traps are. And if you don't, you have a thief in your party who can find the traps and then disarm the traps. Because this by itself is useless. The druid, cleric, shaman cannot disarm the trap. All it can do is find them. So it doesn't really help all that much. I guess, like, if you're brand new to the game, and you're in Durlax Tower or some other area you've never been to, and your thief just died, and you don't want to go back to town yet, and you want to know if there's a trap on this chest that you're about to open, and you have a knock spell to open it because your thief is already dead and you can't use and pick the lock, then you could use fine traps to find out if there's a trap on it. And then you still have to trigger the trap by opening. I don't understand the point of this. I don't understand the point of this whatsoever. Finding a trap, but not being able to disarm it, doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't do anything for you at all. And the worst part is, most of the traps in the game that aren't on, you know, chests, are in such a way that you can't continue without triggering the trap. Like Nashkel Mines, for example. There's one trap in the north that you can avoid, so this would be useful there. But when you're going through the secondary entrance that leads to Mullahay's Cave, uh, just before that third area, there's three traps in front of the doorway. You can't walk by that shit. So find traps doesn't really do anything for you there. There's a variety of places like that in the game, the Candlekeep Crypt especially, where you are going to trigger those traps, 100%. And I just don't know where this spell would really come in handy. I just can't think of a thing. I can't think of a situation where you need this spell. 
unless you're playing without a thief. But like I said, chances are, if you're bold enough to play this game without a thief, you know where the traps are. Hell, you might even know what the trap is. That's gotten to be that point. I, I pretty much know not only where every trap is, but also what the damn thing does. So I know to put on lightning resist before I trigger a lightning bolt trap. But this dog shit, can't say enough bad things about it. Get the hell out of here. I don't know what it's there for. Up next is Flame Blade. This is available to all three classes, just like the Find Trap spell. This is another uh, weapon summoning spell, but this one lasts even shorter. The faster cast time of four, duration of four rounds, plus one every two levels. And the sword will do 1d4 points of slashing, plus 1d2, plus four points of fire damage. However, just like the others, it is not a magical weapon, so creatures struck only by magical weapons are not harmed by it. Big deal. Big deal. It, the exact same thing applies to... Um, Beast Claw in the sense that you can throw a weapon in your offhand and dual wield with this and not suffer a dual wield penalty. But as we said before, if you're a pure cleric or a pure druid, you really don't want to be walking into melee. You really don't. You don't want to be walking into melee. It's too risky. And if you're a fighter cleric, then chances are you're already specialized and already put points into dual wielding. And you probably have a better weapon than this. Now granted, this does do fire damage, right? So if you're completely out of fire arrows, don't have any fire spells and you, you are fighting some trolls, and you don't have a single weapon that does elemental damage, then you know you got the flame blade here to take them out, assuming you can kill them all in four plus one every two round per level's uh, time. But this is just so underwhelming. It kills me. It's just so underwhelming, it kills me. And then there's a slashing damage on top of it, right? At least as a cleric, you can use a flail to beat the crap out of undead. When it's swapped to slashing damage, you can't even hit the undead with it. I guess the fire damage kind of makes up for it, because undead aren't immune to fire, they're just immune to cold, but still, I just... This feels so incredibly underwhelming for a level 2 spell. If, it, if you got this at level 1, I would almost be inclined to take it. This feels honestly like a level 1 cleric spell. This really does. 4 rounds plus 1 every 2 levels, this feels like a level 1 spell to me. And if it was level 1, it wouldn't be that bad. But the big issue this with this, and just like so many others, is that if you're a cleric especially, you have way better shit to cast than Flame Blade. Way, way, way better spells to cast. Way better. And if you're a cleric or a druid, or excuse me, a druid or a shaman, I mean, you can use this, but why would you, man? Why? Well, I don't see the purpose. Like I said, even if you're a multi-class, and if you're a multi-class, in some ways it's actually worse. In some ways it's actually not as good as using your main weapon. So, terrible spell, C tier all the way. But it is better than Goodberry. Goodberry is our other uh, RP tier spell, along with no alignment. Goodberry creates five magical berries that the caster can heal with them, and each berry restores one HP when eaten. Casting time of nine. But those berries are permanent, buddy. Those berries last forever. They're absolutely delicious. Supposedly in pen and paper, you actually have to eat. And if you don't eat, you die. Because, you know, that's how it works. It's not how it works in Baldur's Gate. You don't need to eat food. So that usefulness of good berry does not transfer over. Instead, you have basically five crappy potions that heal for one hit point each, but still take up your action for the round when used. So if you eat a good berry, you can't cast a spell... You can't pop a potion. You can't use an HLA. Your action for the round is taken up. You can still auto attack, but your action for the round is taken up. How incredibly underwhelming. If you eat all five of them, if you just shove them all in your mouth after a fight, you know what can heal for five HP? Cure Light Wounds. That's a level one spell. Cure Moderate Wounds heals 2d8 plus one per level. 2d8 plus one. This heals for five. Five. Now, you can't argue that you can sell good berries. And I did the math on this. Good berry, you can, ca you can make 5 per round. That means you make 50 per turn. That means 250 per hour. Assuming you're resting and not getting interrupted, that is 250 good berries conjured per hour per druid in your party. So if you've got 6 druids, each of them making 250 good berries every hour, that is 1,250 good berries every hour, boys. A good berry sells for 1 gold each. You are literally making 1,250 gold per hour with a party of six druids making good berries. That is not something to sneeze at right there, boys. And that is something to keep in mind. That is something to keep in mind. That is some good cash money right there. This is absolutely worthless. Amazingly worthless. If you could actually just shove all these in your mouth and it wouldn't take up the action per turn, this spell would actually be fairly decent, because then you could make a bunch of them and then just throw them to your fighters, and then mid-combat you could just shovel them down your throats and heal for a bunch of HP, but you can't. You can only eat one per round, and you can't drink a potion, which heals for eight times more, or 17 times more, or 40 times more, depending on whether you're playing BG1, 2, or throwing a ball and which potion you're chucking. This kills me. It kills me. Absolute dog shit. 
RP tier spell of the way. Only time I ever use this is just for fun. Just for absolute meme purposes. It's garbage. Up next, no alignment. Almost equally as bad. At least good berries can be sold, right? This is a uh, divination spell that will target every creature. It says one creature, but I'm pretty sure that's a lie. I thought this was an AoE spell. Detect Evil might be the AoE spell, and No Alignment might be single target, so... And that's the case. This makes it even worse than I thought. Long cast time of 9. Uh, targets one creature, and they can save and negate, but if they fail their save, you will know what their alignment is. Uh, and assuming they don't have magic resistance, right? I tried to use this on a Melisande for fun, thinking that I would be able to figure out uh, if she was good or neutral or evil, and she resisted it, of course, because, you know, she's got magic resistance. But, um... What a complete waste of a spell. What a complete waste of a spell. Chances are, when you're talking to somebody two seconds in, you know whether they're good, neutral, or evil. If someone walks up to you and says, I got a blade with your name on it, you don't need to cast no alignment to know that shit's about to go down and there's going to be a fight here. At no point in the game, you're like, gosh, I don't know whether to trust this man. Now, there is one particular instance of the game where knowing whether someone is evil is important. If you're a paladin and you don't want spoilers, cover your ears right now. For everyone else who's a normal person, uh, if you do the paladin quest... In Baldur's Gate 2 for the Stronghold, there will be a time where you're protecting some girl and some dude comes to pick her up. You have to use Detect Evil to see if he's good or evil. If he shows up as evil, you have to fight him, and you that's how you win that's how you win that encounter. If you fail to use Detect Evil, the man was evil, picked up the girl, and murders her, you fail your quest, you fail your test, you're no longer, you know, you're no longer part of the Order of the Radiant Heart. But you have to use a Detect Evil for that. That is the only time in the history of this game where this spell would actually be useful. Right there. That is the only time in the history of this entire game where this would be useful. But Paladins get Detect Evil as a baseline ability, so you don't even need to use this one. I think, I, like I said, I used it once or twice to see if I could see uh, whether a Melisan was good or evil. And uh, like I said, if she has magic resistance, she resists it anyway. So there's no point in using this spell. It's RP tier all the way. You just use this if you're actively roleplaying. Otherwise, it's absolute garbage. But I don't think you needed me to tell you that. Up next, there's this Fire and Cold. This on surface level seems like it would be good, but here's the issue. Only targets one creature, which is fine. Cast time of five, also fine. But here's the problem. Duration of one round per level. Even Bark Skin has four base rounds plus one per level. Resist Fire and Cold lasting one round per level and giving you 50% damage reduction is so worthless. This gives you 50% reduction to Fire and uh, Cold. It will stack with Armor of the Faith and other equipment, so you can use this to get 100%, but would it only lasts for one round per level? That's horrendous, and especially if you're a druid, right? Especially if you're a druid and you're stuck at 14 forever. Using this late game is just painful as hell. But why would you use it at all? Mages get a, a spell called Protection from Fire and Protection from Cold. Granted, you have to use one of each, but they both give you 100%, and they last for like an hour per level, basically. I think it's a turn per level. But when you're a level 15 wizard, that spell's never wearing off, dude. That's literally several hours of in-game time. Several hours of game time. And to the point where they last so long that they will not wear off until you rest or unless they're dispelled. This is the exact opposite. If you cast this at the beginning of a dungeon, it will be off before you finish the second fight. It will be gone before you finish the second fight. And this is a spell that you want on everybody. You want everybody in your party to be resisting fire and cold. That's why elemental gear is so damn good in Baldur's Gate 2 and Throne of Ball. Because later in the game, elemental damage is what matters the most. Along with being protected, you know, from magical energy, so horrid wilting. But every wizard in the game is going to be hitting you with Dragon's Breath and Comet back to back using improved alacrity. And not having protection from fire is just an absolute death sentence because those spells hit ridiculously hard on the same difficulty. Same thing when it comes to fighting dragons, right? If you're going to fight, you know, a fur crag without fire resistance, you're going to die in two seconds. Dragon's Breath hits way, way too damn hard on the same difficulty. And same thing for all the other dragons. You have to have your resistances up, but this isn't enough. It's only 50. And I guess you could say, well, you can combine this with a potion and then save your mage a spell slot, but chances are, unless you kill them super quickly, this is going to wear off mid-fight. And then the Dragon's Breath has a chance to ignore protections on top of it, right? So all of a sudden, you were at, a, you thought 100%, this wears off, now you're at zero. Because the protection will, um, the uh, Dragon's Breath can go through potions. So it's just, this kills me. This kills me. The only time I think I ever tried using this was in the Shade Lord's Dungeon to walk over the lava. But it's only 50%, right? So all it really does is cancel out the, the true immunity, the, excuse me, the double damage uh, component of insane difficulty. So it's just, it's worthless. It's trash. It's absolutely trash. If it was like an insta-cast and it lasted for a decent amount of duration per level, even just three rounds per level would make this so much better. 
Hell, even two would make this almost viable. But as it is, it's C tier all the way. Absolute dog shit. Up next, Slow Poison. Slow Poison is actually the only S tier spell that um, that uh, Druids and Shamans get. It's the only S tier spell Druids and Shamans get. I may be overrating this spell, but I can't, I can't play without it. It's so damn important and so damn good. So despite what the name implies, this will actually completely uh, cure all poisons on the creature. All poisons. It will target one creature, stupidly quick cast time one, and it happens instantly. And the reason this spell is so good is because poisons are absolutely devastating on insane difficulty. In Baldur's Gate 1, if you get poisoned by a greater basilisk, that will actually kill you. The poison is so strong and lasts so long that it will actually kill you. The Hobgoblin Elite Poison typically won't kill you, assuming you aren't level 1 or 2. It doesn't do enough poison damage. But the Basilisk one will. The Spider one absolutely will. Especially if you're hit by a Phase Spider or, or a Wyvern. That's, that poison does 10 damage per second on insane difficulty. 10 per second. That means even if you're Kagan, you could die in a single round of poison damage. Let alone if you're playing a Wizard or something and gets poisoned. But don't forget, that poison also goes through Stone Skin and Mirage, right? You can easily get poisoned on your backline, despite them not even taking physical damage. And poisons are absolutely nasty like i just said you die in seconds you have to have a cleric on the ready with this learned and not casting anything you'll notice that whenever we fight spiders i don't have my clerics do anything i have them stand close to the melee and close to the back line just in between them so if anybody gets poisoned by a spider teleporting behind them and biting them we're able to ca cast slow poison instantly because if you don't they will die and this also works really well in bg2 when you're fighting mummies mummy breath is also a poison effect despite it being a disease Mummy Breath does actually even more than the Phase Spider damage in BG1. If you thought 10 damage per second was quick, a greater Mummy Breath can take you from 160 to 0 in half a round. Especially because in Baldur's Gate 2 you're hasted all the time, right? And when you're hasted, you take double effect from regenerative effects, but you also take double effect from poisons. And if you're poisoned, or excuse me, if you're hasted and fighting a mummy, and chances are you are hasted when fighting a mummy, and you get breathed on, it is a death sentence. You absolutely have to have a cleric, or a druid, or a shaman, somebody there in melee casting this right away, or you will die. It is so dangerous that I don't actually melee mummies on my main character, ever. It doesn't matter if I'm a berserker mage, it doesn't matter if I am a barbarian, it doesn't matter what class I am, no matter how tanky I think I am, I do not go toe-to-toe -to -toe with mummies. Because getting hit by a mummy breath can literally kill you in half a round. It's just not worth the risk to me. But Slow Poison will make up for that and help save your front line and back line when you're fighting mummies, when you're fighting spiders, when you're fighting graders, when you're fighting edder caps, when you're fighting enemies who are using the ranged uh, poison uh, ammo, like elite hobgoblins, the sirens using the arrows of biting. This works for that. Also works for bolts of biting if you're getting hit by those. There are just so many damn poison effects in this game. That slow poison is absolutely mandatory. I always have at least two of these, sometimes more, on any druid or cleric in my party because it's so critical. I think I am overrating it at S tier. It really should be A, but it's just so damn devastating. And this spell is so effective at countering it because it's stupidly quick, right? If this was a long cast, I would definitely drop it down to B or, or excuse me, to A tier. But the fact that it's one time, literally one, is just so damn good. If you're wearing an uh, amulet of power, for example, this is literally an instant cast. So damn good. And for that reason, for me, I think I am slightly overrating it, but it would either be one of the best A tier spells in the game or a really, really weak S tier. But I'm going to leave it at a weak S tier for that. All right, so that's all the uh, cleric, or excuse me, the druid spells. We do have one more to talk about for shaman only. Shamans get Writhing Fog at level 2. Duration of one turn. This is basically a little baby cloud kill. Cast time at 2, so it's actually got a pretty decent cast time. Really quick. A 15 foot radius, and anybody inside the radius, this is not party friendly, will take 1d3 points of cold damage per round. In addition, there's a 20% chance that they must save or death or be slowed for one round. Creatures immune to cold damage do not suffer any adverse effects from the spell. Absolute crap. 1d3 points of damage per of cold per round is not only extremely lackluster, but then the secondary component, they get a chance to save on top of it. For Grease spell, if I throw a load of Grease at somebody, granted Grease doesn't do damage, but it's a level 1 spell. If I throw a Grease at somebody, even if they save, they're slowed. Even if they save, they are slowed. Not only do they get a chance to save, but then they also only have a 20% chance of being forced to save in the first place. Just for fun, I tested this on a bandit ambush before I did this video. 8 bandits spawn. I dropped a Writhing Fog. This spell went the full turn duration, the full 60 seconds. Only 3 bandits actually uh, got slowed. Three out of eight over 60 seconds. That means this proc 10 times. 
10 times. So granted, that's just some bad RNG. But the fact that they get a 20% chance just to get a chance to save in the first place, this is just terrible. And that it doesn't even affect undead. It doesn't even work on skeletons, right? Because then it would make it decent. You know, if you could actually hit skeletons with this level 2 AoE spell, clearing skeletons out quickly, super useful, right? But it doesn't work for that. It doesn't work for that at all, and that just absolutely kills me. I don't know why this exists. If this was really... If it did fire damage, then this would actually be pretty decent. But it doesn't. It does cold. And that just kills it for me. It kills it. This isn't terrible. It's definitely not C tier, because as we mentioned before, right? Shamans and druids don't get shit for spells. The shaman shares the druid spell uh, spell list for level 2. Well, they share for all of them, obviously. But their level 2 spells are absolutely terrible. They're dog shit. So this is better than nothing. It's better than bark skin. Shut up, Baconia. Good lord. Um, so it's better than nothing, but at the same time, you're just not getting anything good out of it. it. The damage is really too little. The slow effect is so infrequent. And then the slow effect only lasts for one round as well, right? If it lasted for, like... A turn or the duration of the spell I know it would be almost better but it's just crap it's just absolute crap all right let's start talking about the cleric spells let's get the hell out of the crappy druid spells but let's start off with a really crappy cleric spell first all right up next we have aid aid has a decent cast time of five targets one creature lasts for one round plus one round per level and this will give them the benefits of a blessed spell so plus one attack to rolls and saving throws and an additional 1d8 HP for the duration of the spell what an incredibly wa useless waste of a spell. On paper, this sounds like this would be something you'd pre-buff, right? You know, you'd give your uh, your fighter some extra HP, give them the benefits of a blessed spell, then let them go in, right? But it lasts for one round plus one per level. So let's say you're a level three cleric, you just got this spell. That means aid lasts for 18 seconds. 18 seconds of real time. And you have to be in melee and touch them to do it. This game... <laughs> No fight in this game lasts less than 18 seconds. Unless you're fighting one dude and you hit him with some CC. That's the only way a fight's going to last less than 18 seconds. And if you're doing that, you don't need aid, right? If you're doing that, you don't need aid. If you want to use this to heal, you have a better heal. It's right here. It's called Cure Moderate Wounds. Hell, even Cure Light Wounds is going to be a better heal than fucking aid. <coughs> Excuse me. I guess you could argue that late game, this, well, you know, Bless only lasts for six rounds. But late game... You don't need Bless anyways. Bless isn't going to be doing a lot for you. Unless you're sitting on like six people, a full party who's using a buttload of attacks per round or they're popping Greater Whirlwind or something. And then you could say, well, Bless is technically doing an extra, you know, 60 damage per round on my party because they're doing one more damage. But eight only hits one person. It's a level two spell, hits one person. It's basically the combination of Cure Light Wounds and Bless. That's literally what this spell is. It's crap. It's crap. I'm assuming this would be better in pen and paper. Uh, I have no idea how it possibly could be if it does the exact same thing as it does here because I know for a fact that fights in pen and paper take way longer than they do in Baldur's Gate but overall garbage spell definitely don't want to take it C tier all the way oh these are cleric only in case I didn't mention that at the start oh the spells I'm talking about now are cleric only the others could have been shared but I mentioned that each time up next is chant chant is one of the best spells that clerics get you'll notice that clerics get like four really amazing spells and then druids get one and the rest are just absolute crap. And even then, the one is slow poison, right? So it's not like I use this all the time in every fight. It's just situational, but it's so critical for those situations. Anyways, chant, amazing spell. Very long cast time of nine, lasts for one turn. And what this does is it gives you and your party luck, and it puts a negative luck penalty on enemies. And I'll do my best to explain this because it can be a little confusing. What this will do is it will give you a plus one bonus to attack rolls. That's fairly straightforward, right? You have one less stacko you have to need in order to hit your uh, in order to actually hit enemies. This gives you a plus one bonus to minimum damage rolls. And what I mean by that is if I'm using a longsword, a longsword is 1d8 damage. I'm swinging my longsword at an enemy. It can do 1 to 8 damage before it adds strength bonus. What this will do is that one is cut off. My minimum is now two. I will now deal two to eight damage with every swing of my longsword. In addition, you get a bonus to saving throws, and finally, the spell damage, not physical damage, but spell damage you take is reduced. If someone shoots a 66 fireball at you, it will deal 65 instead. And that is actually really, really useful. That is really, really useful. Because this isn't just you, this is for your whole damn party. Magical damage is typically what's get what gets people permed in Baldur's Gate. With very few exceptions, magic is what's usually doing the permas. So you're getting hit by a fireball, or... Excuse me. Or an ice ball, if your name is Gandhi. There's a variety of magic in this game that is going to be very likely to permakill you. Lightning bolt, etc, etc. 
A chant will greatly reduce the damage you take as a whole. Now granted, a chant is not going to stop somebody who's about to take 100 damage from a spell when they only have 50 HP from getting perma. It won't save them. However, if you're sitting on 50 HP and you're getting hit by a uh, fireball, which would normally be doing up to 72 damage on insane difficulty, this will drop it from 66, which multiplied is 36 max, 72 on insane, to 65, which is 30 damage max, 60 on insane. That's 12 damage you just shaved off there. And then you uh, factor in the fact that chances are not every roll is going to be maxed, right? So all of a sudden, instead of a spell doing up to 72 damage on somebody who has 50 HP, all of a sudden they get for hit for like 45. They might actually live through that. And granted, it might kill them too. They might get hit for 55, but at least they're not going to get permed, right? And granted, that's only if the stars align and goes right down that list there. But still, that's pretty damn useful. And then it gives them a penalty to enemies too, which means that enemies are going to have a minus penalty to Thacko, a minus penalty to saves, a minus penalty to their damage, and they will be taking more damage from spells. So instead of them taking 66 from your skull trap, they're now going to be taking 67. Now granted, you know, going from 36 to 42 damage isn't absolutely amazing, but when it's spread over a group of enemies, this adds up pretty quick, especially if you're rocking multiple spellcasters. If you have Edwin and Nolly in your party both dropping Horde Wilting, Chant will actually make a pretty decent difference in damage taken for an AoE group. And it lasts for a full turn, which granted isn't a super long time, but usually enough time for one particular fight, right? That's usually enough. One turn is usually time it takes for a fight to be over. And that's really, really strong. Now, granted, it doesn't stack. You can't use multiple chants. But it does stack with the luck bonus that bards get. And so if you have chant up along with a bard using his bard song, that's actually a pretty decent bonus to luck. You'll reduce the damage you take as a, as a whole as a party pretty severely. It's really actually quite nice. And this is intangible, so you can't see it, right? You can't look at it and be like, ah, you know, look how strong that chant is. Look at that right there. You can feel it because you really can't. But this is the unnoticeable difference that makes all the difference in the world. Really awesome spell. I always, always take this as a cleric. It's absolutely, it's practically mandatory. Taking this and casting it will make a big difference, especially over the course of a long fight where people are getting hit by damage multiple times. When you're in late throwing a ball and you have regeneration on your front line and you're casting greater restoration and you're casting a variety of abilities to bring people's HP back to full, mass raise dead, etc., Chant over the course of a fight may save you literally hundreds of points of damage. Literally hundreds of points of damage. And that's insane. That's insane. That's really, really, really good. For a level 2 spell that any cleric can cast, absolutely amazing. And it scales well from the beginning of Baldur's Gate 1 all the way to Throne of Ball. And it's very, very rare that you get a spell that scales like that. Definitely take that. Can't say enough good things about it. Really awesome spell all the way. Like I said, I always take this shit. Every single time I have a cleric in my party, and that's why really clerics are so good in Baldur's Gate 1, is because chant, hold, and silence. We'll talk about the others in just a minute, but these three spells scale so incredibly well in BG1 that these three alone, if, if clerics didn't get anything after level 2, I would still take a cleric in Baldur's Gate 1 because these spells are that fucking good. They're literally that fucking good. So, uh, chant... Awesome, take it. I also do want to point out if you're playing with SCS, and the Icewind Dale version will slow the, the uh, caster by half. Keep that in mind. So it will make them a little bit, you know, more vulnerable because they can't actually move and dodge as effectively. Um, but it's still absolutely amazing. This doesn't happen in the base game, by the way. If you're playing unmodded, you do not get this, uh, this movement slow. But it does with SCS. Up next, whole person, also S tier, amazing spell. Enchantment Charm School, not like it matters. There's no specializations for clerics. Uh, lasts for one turn, casting time of five, targets one creature, and will hit any enemy within four feet, saving through the gates, and this is just a quick hold. This will hold them for a full turn. Enemies that are held cannot move, they cannot attack, they cannot cast, they cannot defend themselves. An enemy who is held is a dead enemy. All it takes is anyone left-clicking or right-clicking, whatever the hell you want to do, they're going to die in two seconds. Hold is absolutely busted. Now, granted, this only works on humanoids, so you can't cast it on, like, say, an ogre, for example, because they're not technically human. They're this weird monster thing. It's not going to work on creatures like wyverns or spiders, which is a shame, but there are a lot of humanoid enemies in Baldur's Gate. A ton. This will work on gnolls. This will work on sirens. This will work on everything that's a human. This will work on dwarves and gnomes. This will work on hobgoblins. This will work on the guards and the iron and cloakwood for the iron throne that are absolutely absolutely obnoxious to deal with with scs because they're so ridiculously tanky for some dumbass reason despite wearing chainmail 
This spell is super useful. This spell will turn a fight like the ambushes, the Amazons, and the dwarf ambush, and from a really nasty fight into a cakewalk. And the fact that it not only does it hit the target, but it's an AoE on top of it. So you can literally hold multiple enemies with this. Absolutely amazing. This is the spell that I take a lot of as well. If I'm a cleric, right, in Baldur's Gate, I, what I typically do is I do two slow poisons, one chant, two holds, and a silence. That's what I typically take on a cleric. Because those spells are so incredibly strong and make so many fights so damn easy. You really can't say enough good things about it. It's amazing. This is also useful on the horrible off chance that Kagan just got charmed by a siren. The sirens are dead, so you don't have to worry about them, you know, killing anyone else in your party. But Kagan's about to beat the shit out of you with his skull, uh, with, his, with his axe, and cave your skull in. You hit him with a quick hold person. You can use this to CC your own party members, and they no longer can attack you. That's nice. That's useful, too. You want to be careful with that, because obviously if there are enemies up, then they are easily killed. And you don't want your own party members to die, even if they're temporarily attacking you. But it is nice in that regard. It's actually useful. And I just realized I skipped a spell, so we're going to go back in just a second. Really, really good spell. Absolutely amazing in Baldur's Gate 1. Definitely tapers off in Baldur's Gate 2 and Throne of All. Just because they're pretty much every wizard in the game is going to be using Minor Globe, right? Literally every wizard in the game is going to be using Minor Globe. But this will still... And uh, every cleric is going to be using free action, right? So they're going to be immune to hold. But for BG1, this spell is literally the sleep of clerics. It is so good and useful in so many damn encounters that you just really don't ever want to play a cleric and not take this spell. It's that good. Uh, up here is Drop Unholy Might, which I accidentally skipped over. Sorry about that. This is a spell that depends on whether you are a fighter cleric multi-class or you are a cleric. If you are a pure cleric, the spell is absolutely worthless. If you are a fighter cleric multi-class, the spell is amazing. So what this does is a super quick cast time of two, lasts for a full turn, and it will boost your con, strength, and dexterity by one point for every three levels. So at one, You'll get a one, or excuse me, a level three, which is the first time you can cast this spell. You'll get a boost of one at level twelve. It'll be four, and I believe this will cap at eighteen. Um, and I believe it gives you a plus six bonus at level eighteen. That is awesome if you're a multi-class. If you're a pure class, you don't get anything else from con, right? Every every single con point over sixteen does absolutely nothing for a pure class. That's not a fighter ethos, right? Because the fighter ethos gets bonus from HP. Every other class doesn't. They don't get any more bonuses after sixteen. You could get passive regeneration. Um, from having over 20 com, but the re regeneration is so small, it's really irrelevant. The dex could almost be useful, but you're not really meleeing as a pure cleric either. And so chances are you're not being attacked, and if you are being hit, you're being hit by ranged weapons, and you have better tools to deal with ranged weapons as a cleric anyway. So you can throw on the shield that does reflecting, you can actually cast a spell that is reflecting, you have entropy shield that makes you immune, there's so many things you can do with ranged weapons as a cleric that the dexterity becomes useless too. And then what about the strength? Well, if you're a cleric, you're only sitting on one attack per round. And chances are you're using a sling if you're sitting in the back line, right? Because again, you don't want to melee as a pure cleric. You do not have the HP to tank shit as a pure cleric. You just don't. You just don't. Full plate is not enough to make you a tank in Baldur's Gate 2. And in Baldur's Gate 1, you get 8 HP per level. All it takes is one good crit. And you are chunked out if not dead, especially if you're fighting like a berserker or something. I think will turn you into goo in seconds. So you don't want to be in melee then either. So the really only benefit you're getting from this spell is the strength bonus on your sling which is attacking one time per round. And even if for some reason you are bold enough to melee, when you're dual wielding as a cleric, you're sitting on two APR, two, four with improved taste, which you don't get in Baldur's Gate 1. So I really don't see why you'd ever use this as a pure cleric. However, when you are a fighter cleric multi-class, the dex is useful. You're in melee. You are going to be getting hit a lot. Dexterity, the more the merrier, right? Better AC. Constitution, same thing. Every point above 15 is going to give you an extra bonus HP per level. With some exceptions, obviously, sometimes you have to go from 19 to 21 before you get another uh, point, um, and etc, etc. But for the most part, more con, better. You can easily hit 25 constitution with drop on Holy Might, and that gives you a large extra boost of HP. That's awesome. And then the strength bonus on top of it. You could literally hit 25 strength with drop on Holy Might. That is awesome. Hitting for an absolute ton. You don't even need Crumb Fair when you have Drop on Holy Might. And as I mentioned before, a lot of these spells don't scale well in a TOB. Drop on Holy Might actually does. If you are Fighter Cleric Multi-Class, this spell is really amazing in Throne of Ball. Really, really strong. And granted, it doesn't last long, one turn, but it has such a quick cast time of two that you can literally and very easily recast this mid-fight without any issues. Very, very quick to cast, especially if you're using Amulet of Power. It's basically as fast as a stone skin. I mean, it's so good. So good. So if you're a multi-class, S tier. If you're not, C tier. So it really depends on the class here, but really awesome spell or really crappy spell depending on what you're playing. 
Obviously, you can't use it on companions, right? Animan using the spell, going into melee, probably not going to get you much. Vicky using this, going into melee, also a bad idea. But if you're a multi-class, really good spell. Really good spell. And finally, we have Silence, 15-foot radius. Oh, no, we actually do have one more. Oh, God, spiritual Hammer, of course. How could I forget? Silence, 15-foot radius, the other S-tier spell. Clerics just get so many. They literally have four S-tier spells at level two. And Druids and Shamans get one, and that's really a stretch to call it an S-tier spell. It just kills me. It kills me. And they actually, excuse me, Druids and Shamans get the most shit for early levels from Icewind Dale, and they're still not good. Kills me. All right, decent cast time of five, 15 foot radius, last two rounds per level, and this is literally just a silence. It's literally what it says. It's a silence. But what's amazing about this is that it comes with a massive minus five saving throw penalty. I have no idea why this is so incredibly powerful. Minus five is huge. There is literally not a single spell in this entire game that comes with such a heavy penalty for enemies. I can't literally cannot think of a single spell off the top of my head that has a massive, more massive penalty than minus five. Chaos is like minus four, minus six if you're uh, an enchanter. But it's minus four base, and this is minus five. The only spell I can think of in the entire game that enemies get included is Wing Buffet that dragons can use, and that gives you a massive minus ten uh, penalty to save versus breath. But this is five. If you cast Malison, Greater Malison, and then a Curse before casting this spell, that means enemies have a negative 10 modifier to save. 10. Double digit penalty to their saves. If they have a save of 10, and they roll a... a, a they can roll... It's kill. It's insane. If their save is 10, and you cast those two spells and hit them with a Silence, they literally have to roll a 20 to save. A perfect 20 to actually successfully save versus this spell. That is beyond insane. But granted, pretty much every wizard is going to have Vocalize and Minor Globe up, making them completely immune to this shit, but clerics won't. Clerics have no defense whatsoever against Silence. They have no defense whatsoever. No defense at all. And there's some other fun things you can do with this too. When people are silenced, they can't be talked to. So what that means is if you're about to go into an encounter where there's a dialogue trigger, someone walks up to try to talk to you to say something to start an encounter, you can silence your party and you can't be spoken to. You could technically use this to walk into the Ducal Palace and be completely ignored by the guards. That is interesting. I haven't really played around much with this, but I did test it a little bit ago and I was indeed correct because I knew deafness worked the same, but I wasn't sure if silence did. For some reason, it's treated the exact same as deafness to where you can't hear, uh, if someone's deafened, they can't hear, um, uh, what is it? Uh, the Bard song, right? If someone's deafened, they can't hear the Bard song. I think that was something that Beamdog changed recently because I'm pretty sure you could in the original game, although I'm not 100% sure. It's been a long-ass time. But there are a lot of things you can do with this. Enemies also will not turn hostile with this. If you're a cheesy piece of shit and you're about to fight a mage, you can literally silence him and then blow him up and there's absolutely nothing he can do to defend himself because he will not actually be able to uh, respond by going hostile and casting Vocalize until you attack. And so the first thing he'll do is uh, go and cast Vocalize, but that's a, a, a whole round. That's a whole round being wasted. An entire round being wasted by that wizard. That gives you a full round to beat the crap out of him with impunity. This spell is so good. So damn good. And like I said, clerics clerics have a lot of tools to deal with hold later on in the game. They have divine intervention. They have free action. There's all sorts of things they can do to protect themselves physically. There is nothing they can do to protect themselves from silence. This spell is useful from Baldur's Gate 1 all the way through throwing a ball. Getting uh, attacked by sirens, for example, those nasty charm effects. Silence 15 foot radius will silence almost all of them. This completely wipes out the uh, bonus to saves they get from improved invisibility. It's so good. There's so many times in this game where you want to just drop the silence, man. Really, really useful. 10 out of 10 spell. Pick this shit up. It's amazing. And lastly, we have Spiritual Hammer, the exact opposite. Just another uh, weapon summon. Last three rounds, plus one per level. Similar cast time of five. Cleric only. And it is the exact same as a regular Warhammer. However, it strikes with a bonus of plus one, back and damage for every six levels of the caster. How absolutely underwhelming. How incredibly underwhelming. Oh, it actually does less damage to larger opponents too. Hilarious. Because striking with a magical Warhammer wasn't already bad enough as is. It does even less damage to larger opponents. If you want to get a plus two Warhammer, all you have to do is go and kill Basilius. He dies fairly easily in the base game, and when you hit him with a silence and uh, using SCS, he dies pretty quickly and easily here too. It is beyond me why they have not one, but two weapon summons at level two, and both of them are shit. 
Same thing applies to before. If you're dual wielding as a pure cleric, you no longer have a penalty by using this weapon, but it's not enough to make up for the fact that this weapon sucks ass. It's not enough to make up for the fact that this could have been a slow poison, a silence, a hold person, or a chant, possibly even a cure of moderate wounds, and I would definitely take draw upon Holy Might if I was a multi-class over this absolute piece of trash over here. Absolutely take this over that. So I don't really know what it's doing there. I really would love to tell you guys that there's some really cool things you can do with Flame Blade, Beast Claw, and Spiritual Hammer. I can't think of any aside from avoiding the dual wield penalty, but as I mentioned before, I, it's still not enough to make me want to go into melee on a pure cleric or druid, and if I'm a fighter uh, multi-class, I would rather use my own weapon than use one of these, especially considering I can take something else instead. No reason to take one of these garbage spells. So, if you find a use for this shit, let me know, guys. I apologize it took so long to get this video. This is actually the third time I'm recording it. The first time got rejected by YouTube. The second time, I accidentally recorded the whole damn thing while having my microphone muted. So, that was super fun. I apologize if this video seems rushed, or I didn't talk about spells as much as you guys wanted to. If there's something that you like to use the spell for, or if you found a use for a spell that I think is shit, or if you just think I'm full of shit, let me know down there in the comments, boys. Really appreciate you watching. I'm so sorry again it took me so long to get this video up. YouTube and I have been going back and forth for a long time now. Hopefully, we'll be able to get a steady stream of these going. I'd like to get at least one per week, every week, in addition to the other videos that we're putting up here. As always, dudes, thank you so much for watching. Really appreciate all the love and support. Let me know what you think down here in the comments. And again, I'm sorry, this is boring as hell. Level two, there just really isn't anything fun or interesting you can do with these spells and abilities. There just isn't. There's just, there's nothing you can do with fine traps to make it be like, wow, I never really thought of it that way. Thank you so much to Veyorn for telling me just how awesome this spell actually is. There's really nothing cool you can do with this shit. And I'm sorry for that, lads. Three will be a lot more fun. There's a lot more fun shit you can do with three. But uh, until then, my friends, see you next time. Thanks for watching, as always, and God bless you, my dudes.